We're back with the question and answer session with uh, Drew Wager and Hey, It's Nick. Uh, if you missed our discussions with Drew on his his experiences with uh, writing for Elite and write, as, as, a, as a writer and his, his early um, experiences with Star Citizen and or uh, Nick's, Nick and I's discussion on things like the, the, the refueling and the... the uh, the new the new stuff from IC. Make sure you check that link up there. It'll be up there in the, in the top left if you are or top left, top, top right, whatever the, over that that direction. I don't know where, where, where the, how this is going to look like on YouTube. So check that out there if you're watching this on YouTube. If you're watching this live, welcome back. Hopefully, if you, you can go back and watch the bot if you need to. But let's get right into the questions and answers for these. Uh, so the first question comes from Steve B. Dancer, who asks um, Drew. Have you done research on Xenothreat and uh, YouTube videos on past video clips on it? Um, what do you think of it and its history? I I have to admit I haven't yet. Uh, I only came across the Xenothreat um, this week actually because obviously I've only been playing uh, a couple of months, so it was a new thing on me. When I when I first saw it, actually, I, I thought uh, I assumed it was. Uh, some kind of alien invasion of some kind of, you know, the, the word Xeno dropped, Zeno. but I didn't realize it was actually an organization that was anti, um, you know, anti aliens and they had an agenda, you know, against everybody else. So, so we we're actually, you know, fighting uh, against other humanoids. Uh, so, um, so no, at this stage, I'm, I'm very much, um, you know, at the stage, I'm, I'm just picking up some of these little threads myself. I haven't had the chance to dive into them too deeply, I'm afraid. Awesome. Um, all I will say about them is that they are, a lot of them are former UEE military who got dis, uh, disenchanted with the ideas of the UEE and feel like everyone is turned against the, they're, they're the Alex Jones of, um, uh, uh of yep. Star Citizen. They're, they're, they're like, they're like the, the corporations are being taken over by the Xi'an and they're going to, they're going to destroy us all and, and that kind of thing. And, and if, uh, you could. Again, CID does a pretty good job of this. If you watch their, their they have that video, it's, I think, online of the uh, the Xenothreat message um, of, like, them, why they're invading Stanton, which is uh, very, very like telling. If you, gave, if you gave Alex Jones an aircraft carrier, that's yeah. what Xenothreat would be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Look, love it. Yeah. Uh, all right. Jin in Tonic asks, uh, refueling. How slash why did humanity forget how to, how to stop pumping when the tank is fuel? Uh, doesn't take AI to, uh, AI to do, um, because it's fun game mechanic. <laughs> That's one of those things where it's like the game takes place over anything. It's trying to make players f focus on manually doing it. Um, that's why. I don't know. <laughs> um, all right. Gin and Tonic asks, Jump Town st uh, stats. Uh, were you surprised with the 12 to 1 legal to illegal mission ratio? Did you play Jump Town, Nick? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, there is a lot of legal. One thing I find interesting with the legal statistics is that there is a lot, very, a lot of legal players, right? But mm -hmm. the ratio on if they were selling it legally or illegally was different. So there mm -hmm. was more people tending to more people of the, who were by taking it legally with the legal mission, but then selling it illicitly. Mm -hmm. So more, more people were doing the legal side and selling illicitly versus the people just sticking to illegal, illegal or good versus good. There was a mix there that went from good to bad to, and there was that crossover. And um, I, I find it interesting that there's no crossover backwards because there, there can't be once you're a bad guy, you're a bad guy. But uh, I find that a very interesting statistics when you actually look at the statistics in there. And um, I like that. I kind of like that gray area of we're going to be the good guys, but we're going to take it over to Grim Hex and sell it illicitly and get more profit. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I also think that, quite frankly, Xeno, the uh, Jump Town needs to be uh, un, unhinged from illegal and illegal and more reputation based. Um, because if, if it was reputation based, you would still have the the risk of doing something illegal and getting caught. But you wouldn't have to just be illegal. You could have someone make the decision: Hey, do you want to work for the good for the good side or the bad side? Do you want to work for the loss legal side or do you want to work for the outlaw side? Because then people will be like, Ah, if I can make more money at the outlaw side where they take some risks, I'll do it. 
And and but it's just too high of a risk. The risk was too high as a as a somebody who is doing illicit missions because if you're doing illicit missions, you just die once anywhere near anytime somebody has like a bounty hunting a bounty mission on you or a uh, uh, call to arms mission and boom you're in jail. So it, I, it just the gameplay just kind of definitely I feel restricted like, it. I feel like that moral ambiguity was really missing mm-hmm. uh, when you're actually down on Jump Town Two. Because there is nothing jamming comma rays or anything. Yeah. So you couldn't make that moral ambiguity of like, you know, I'm going to just kill this person friendly, say I'm still the good guy and just go do it legally, even though I did a really bad thing to say I'm the good guy at the end. So um, I, I feel yeah. like if they had something there that could just jam the comma ray and make it so that like anything goes here and then you come out looking like the good guy again or say you want to look like the bad guy again, I think that'd be a really good like addition to it as well. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm a big fan of of Jump Town being treated like the Wild West. You know, it's it's no one knows what's going on there. You're everyone is out for everyone and the, themselves. You know, you're you're you kind of have to double check everybody's everybody's intentions. You have to either have some trust or just say I don't trust anybody, and then just go in guns blazing because that that makes for interesting stories. It makes for interesting character inter- interactions for like people interacting with one another. It'll leave an impression, and that's what's I think to me when, what what best about gaming is. When you leave it and you're like, I remember this insane moment that happened in this game and it just doesn't leave my head because it's like almost like a movie or like a like a book or or like a, uh, you know, it, it, it's just this thing that, that it, it felt like it happened to me when it's just a character in the game. And that's that's the best part of Jump Town in my mind is that those stories that come out of it, which is the reason why I did a 45 minute documentary on the first one. <laughs> <laughs> and, and one thing I'd like to clarify too now is like when I'm talking about a uh, comma ray jam, I'm not talking about like, like turning on the comma ray on and off that's highly secured and guarded. I'm talking about like maybe a little mini device around Jump Town that could also yeah. be turned off and on again, but something where like, you know, like, like there's this wider area, the entire planet is still secure, but this little tiny pocket you got no data on. Yeah, that makes sense too, you know. Um, all right, this next one is from Steve who asks, uh, Drew. Do you think there, uh, you will write books based on Star Citizen? Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> um, well, I haven't got I haven't got any plans to at the stage, but you know, never say never, I suppose. Um, I mean, I'd have to have some sort of um, interface to CIG, I guess, uh, to, to kind of do that in some sort of official capacity. Um, so, if if that opportunity presented itself, I would t- I would take a very long, hard, serious look at it because it. it it would be a very, very cool thing to be able to do. Um, um, yeah, I must admit, when I first went into Grim Hex, and uh, I, I think I ended up in prison. I can't remember quite why I ended up in prison. <laughs> uh, I think I, I just did something wrong and ended up in prison when I respawned. And I, I remember waking up in prison, effectively, in the game, and thinking, this would be a brilliant way to start a story, you know, either with maybe a little bit of amnesia or something, and suddenly you're just in a prison cell in a space station. You've got no idea how you got there. And um, yeah, maybe then you suddenly inherit this straight cutlass black ship, and it's like, uh, yeah, well, that's a very dodgy ship that your you know, your your grandfather gave you or something. And yeah, he was a really really bad dude. It looks like you're going to follow his yeah you know, anything like that. My brain was already beginning to kind of figure figure out a narrative. So um, I'd, I'd 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 love the opportunity to do it. I, I think that would be really really good fun. But I I, I must admit I, I I don't have a <laughs> I don't have a route to doing so at the moment. So. Um, I'll have to uh, send you the contact information for a couple of people I know at CIG to see that because I, I I was thinking okay, at first like cool. yep. I was thinking at first like oh yeah the the there's the short stories which are written they have four writers on staff and those four mm. one one archivist but she also writes for them as well but so like one's the lead narrative ones and the two of them are kind of make kind of come up with the the big concepts and some some details. And I was like, oh, yeah, they're the ones who write all the stories. And then I realized, no, if you look at the story titles and the people who write them, the people who are writing them are not – they may be the pen names of those writers, but it could be, they, yeah. they look like they're completely different people, maybe writers they contracted to write it. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised if they if they were looking for outside contractors for some of those writing stuff as well. So That, that, that uh, can be quite interesting. I mean, the, I, I did look – one of the things I, I kind of asked early on is, are there, are there any books for Star Citizen? I don't – Unless, unless you can tell me otherwise, I haven't seen any. Not um, yet. They wanted to release okay. books for the game when it. Uh, they had a. They have a plan for a novel for 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 Star Citizen, but they only have short stories. So right. they have they have these short stories, which are really not even novellas or even short stories. They're, they're done usually in bits, like maybe. 
maybe four or five pages in in chunks and maybe a, probably like a 12 okay. part series so maybe at most like 50 pages sort of sort of tiny little little chunks of the universe um but yeah uh so yeah they're okay. not quite yet no. but they do want to do that i know that so well it's it, it might be worth a conversation then because i mean i yeah. could always i could always slot an extra book into my schedule so <laughs> <laughs> we'll, see, we'll see what happens you never know yeah um, all right, Drew, uh, Steve B. Dancer asks, uh, do you feel that the SRV in game will change Xenothreat, uh, that it can now uh, tow damaged Starfarers to Jericho instead of emptying it there? I didn't even think of it like that, like that. So for those of you who haven't played Xenothreat, one of the big things is, um, uh, there are racks of Starfarers that you have to empty out of all its containers. Mm-hmm. Um, but in theory, since the SRV isn't on the roadmap or is, is being worked on, in the theory, you could in the future just tug t- a tow the whole wreck, quantum quantum it with uh, with everything in, involved to where it needs to go. But you would still have to load it onto your cargo ship to sell it. Yeah, you would right like now. The way the cargo works. Yeah. yeah. So that'd be... That'd be interesting. But, but the problem is, is that like right now there's like quantum, the quantum stuff where um, the yellows, I can't remember the name of the actual <laughs> storm of it, but the ones that are quantum sensitive, like the reason why they're quantum sensitive is because you take them out of their housing. But if they're in the housing that they're in on the ship, they're actually like shielded. So yeah, they're stabilized. Would, yeah, they're, they're stabilized. So you should you could, in theory, use an SRV to tow it through quantum oh, to the location just and then just transfer it, it there and sell and yeah. you're safe. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Hmm. I, I think if you can it always give players multiple ways to do a thing, you know, there might be the fast, but risky way, or there might be the slow, but safe way. And you can find ways to, to do a task in lots and lots of different ways, you know, giving the player choice as to how they approach a problem. That, that's always a cool thing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it could happen like that. Um, I'm sure what will happen is is when the SRV comes in game and they do Jericho, someone someone will try it because this is Star Citizen. We'll, we'll do anything. Well, I'll just say, because we're video, we play video games. We're gamers. We, we will try to break things. If you tell us we can't do something, we will do it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That's we'll just the it until it works. <laughs> yeah. Someone will find a way to do it, even if it's not supposedly, supposedly possible. Um, all right. So Gin and Tonic asks, not a question. I just would like to thank Drew for reminding the jaded among us that even around uh, who've been around forever, how special and unique Star Citizen is. So that's not a question, Jim, but thank you. <laughs> um, Elwalk asks, would the table approve of delaying the third system in favor of a new unmapped hidden system for us to discover? Would the dev and writing team burden uh, be too great? Eh. Not really. They could definitely do it. The, the 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 key with Star Citizen, this is one of the things a lot of people get wrong or like don't realize, is that the problem with making systems for CIG is not the systems. They can make a system in about a month. Uh, the problem is is that the each, especially if it's a settled system where people have lived, there is a landing zone, there are outposts, there are signs of human life. So in theory, a brand new system that hasn't been discovered yet, that it's that's vacant, could easily be done for by CIG in a month. Because they don't have to have like elements of human civilization. Or if they, they could have it, because in at least in lore, there's plenty of systems that were discovered, and when they showed up, there were already people there. They just never recorded the findings because why? Uh <laughs> Especially if you're not part of the UEE or don't care about the UEE, you know, if you're a smuggler, hey, this is a great place that nobody knows about but me. So who's to, who's to say they already aren't? Yeah. So. They're, they're secret hidden. They're, they could have 10 of them already. You yeah. don't know. That's true. Would there be a way of um, navigating around such system? Because as I understand at the moment, and you know, my, my knowledge here is very, very limited, but you have to use the quantum drive needs a destination Mm-hmm. marker or like a beacon to be able to navigate you can't just point the quantum drive in a general random direction at the moment so if, at the moment, if you go to a system where those things don't exist are, are you kind of a bit marooned at this point in time potentially yeah uh, i think in the near future they want to do what's called physicalized quantum where where like it's not instead of it being um you have to have a point of interest to jump to the they they unhook the points of interest to more being like this area here because they actually have uh, they're introducing long-range scanning in the near future as well so um, effectively 
by the time they get new systems in, they could easily have long range scanning to find where you where the planets are in your, in a given area and then uh, a, a throw down a little point then jump to that point. So because uh, like in lore, it's you can jump wherever you want. So it's it's more right. of a technical issue that they have right now that they're they're working through. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, I'd be okay with with, with with that. I mean, it would make sense, and I think a lot of people would enjoy that a system that's completely devoid of life, except for uh, or completely devoid of of NPCs and just players. Uh, I can also see that that turning into a death match, into an absolute <laughs> brawl. Um, <laughs> someone finding it and being like, "This is ours," and then just stupid levels of conflict. Uh, which I'm okay with. I like that stuff. So, <laughs> especially if you throw in like valuable minerals on land claims, it's something worth having. Though, exactly. Space. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I know some people would be like, "I wanted to just enjoy this system that was not was just discovered." It's like, well, you got to know where it is. So I don't know. I, I could see that happening. It'd be a great way of of throwing a bone to people who are, especially exploration players, who have yet to see any kind of exploration uh, gameplay yet. So. Uh, all right. Um, Steve B. Dancer asks, Drew. Um, okay, this is someone already asked. Drew, would you write a book for CIG if they asked? Yes. yes. There's, 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 there's a short one to that one. Yeah. <laughs> but give, me, uh, give me a bit of time to figure out. <laughs> uh, Othamon asks, sort of a pointed question to Paul uh, for funny. If the Perseus loner was a redeemer, oh, I hate you. I'm going to stop right there. <laughs> What you don't know about me is I hate the Redeemer. I hate it. It's the one ship that I absolutely loathe that exists. And it's a very long story, but chat likes to get me with it. All right. Um, was a Redeemer instead of a Hammerhead, would you fly it because of that? No, I wouldn't, Othman. I wouldn't fly that. You know that I wouldn't fly that. I would wait until the Perseus comes in because the Perseus is a, is a tiny little gunboat made out of steel and balls. And that's all I care about. All right. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, big guns go boom. Big guns go boom and take a lot of hits. That's that's what I want. Um, all right. From Griffin Gaming RPG, whom you know, Drew. Um, yeah. For, for Drew, have you had any chance to check out the Loremaker's Guide to the Galaxy yet? I have. I have got it on my list, and and thank you very much for 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 those uh, for the sources of providing me with the list. I haven't found the time yet to do it. It is, it is on my very much on my to do list. So um, I, I did have a quick scan of what the content was, um, and it looks really really kind of exactly the sort of thing that I need to kind of get my head around things. So thanks for the, thanks for the links, but no, I haven't had the chance to digest it yet. But uh, it's definitely something I will be doing. All right, uh, Arthurman asks, what's everyone's favorite ship in the verse currently? And uh, what are you looking forward to most ship-wise? Nick, how about you? What's your favorite ship in the verse? Uh, currently, I got to say, I just melted my saber for a Gladius, and I'm enjoying that a lot right now. But my favorite ship right now is the 400 I. I'm, in, I'm really? just enjoying cruising in that. I'm just... You like, you like the glamping? I'm just living vessel? in that. Yeah. I'm just living in it and just cruising, and it's fun <laughs> to just hang out in it. Uh, Drew, favorite ship in the verse currently? Still, still for me, it's my my Cutlass Black. I have to say, I'm I'm very much in love with this ship. Um, it, uh, I just I, I discovered how to do EVAs in my stream last yeah you know, the other day for the first time, and I you know being able to just fly outside my ship and just check out. Where, I was actually smacked into an antenna in um, uh, in Area 18 accidentally when I wasn't paying attention, so I had some damage. And it was quite fun to be able to go outside and have a look. So I, I'm just I'm absolutely loving that ship, and because it's got that Firefly vibe for me, it's just it's just my it's just my favourite ship. There's a lot of other really impressive stuff there to, to get involved with, but right now it's um, it's it's kind of home and it's kind of familiar, so it's kind of my my go-to place, and I just feel very very happy tooling around space in the Cutlass Black. Uh, currently, as I've always said, the Cutlass Black is my favorite ship, but my favorite ship series is always the Freelancer, just because it's, it's, it, whatever you want to do, it's got something for you. Um, though, yeah, no, I just, just, because I am a smuggler in my gameplay. That's what I like to do. I like that sort of, that, that sort of interaction. I tried to do it in Elite and I failed terribly because I cannot turn my systems off fast enough. So uh, Star Citizen, I've learned the, the joys and the thrills of being able to take a little tons of, a little bit of cargo that's worth a lot of money and getting it go as far as I can and try to run from the security, which is 
you can do, but it, it's got consequences. Um, I, I like the gameplay of uh, being able to just look legitimate, but then be like, don't look in the cargo, though. Don't, don't look in the cargo. Look away. Here, yeah. Here's some money. Look away. <laughs> <laughs> I love the um, uh, and again uh, apologies for forgetting the name of the ship. The um, the, the the soul system guys will, will shoot me for MSR? not remembering. But uh, the the one that's basically got the false floor with the mm-hmm. chessboard. Yeah, uh, Mer- Mercury Star Runner. The Mercury that, Star that, Runner. That was just yeah. that was just brilliant. I was like, oh, I've got to get myself one of those at some point because that's just it's brilliant. Having a smuggling hole beneath the main ship, perfect. What if like my that. One of my favorite uh, stories from the Star Citizen universe is the story of called the Belligerent Duck, which is um, in lore the a, an MSR owned by uh, um, uh, Alex Dugan and her uh, Banu um, like co-conspirator uh, Maz Hulan. And they have a they have a there's like an entire video series they did when they released the MSR, which was a story of Alex and one of her former crew members trying to like doing a mission and all these sorts of things uh, together, which was like, you know, very Han Solo esque. And, and the it's the, they're the closest to Han Solo in the in the Star Citizen universe. Uh, and they they actually have a couple. They have a story that was written for them as well during the the run up to it, to the run up for the sale of the MSR. So I, I'm hoping to see more from Alex Dugan and the Belligerent Duck. But yeah, that's I love the MSR. So, um, but um, yeah, but, but currently with smuggling, the best ship to smuggle is the is the the Cutlass Black, and it's just so easy to use. It's so effective, and a lot of people don't realize if you have like a just a tiny little box and you put it right next to the side doors that open open and close. You can actually step up on the box and then um, mantle up onto this into the ship from the sides that a lot of people don't realize. You just need to have a tiny little box below you. So if like you carry like an extra like helmet or something like that, you pull it out of your inventory, you put it down the box, it'll form into a box. You put it down (laughs) on the ground, you step up and you can pull yourself up if the deck door breaks, which it does frequently. Um, All right, Uh, but but what am I looking forward to the future? The the the. The other great uh, Drake ship, which is the uh, Corsair. Corsair, yeah, the Corsair. I gotta love, gotta love my my big my big exploration ship, um, <laughs> exploration ship with more guns than a gunship. Exploration uh, <laughs> for more smuggling opportunities. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Next question comes from uh, Bogs Accordy, who asks, "How do, would you feel about ships becoming more simulatorish?" With stuff like a startup sequence, I mean, I'm, I'm okay. Yeah, with I'm it. up for that. Yeah. I'm okay with it as long as it's optional. As long, like, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's fair. Yeah, uh, I like the um, I like the fact that we've already got a, a, a bit of a startup sequence. If you want to use it, um, you know, I like the fact that I can toggle the engines on and then, yeah, toggle the shields and, and the various other bits of it. That that feels right to me, and I love the MFDs where I can use the ship's controls to talk to comms and all that kind of stuff and fiddle things around and to change the displays. That's that. Yeah. I love that. That just appeals to the OCD in me. Um, I think, I think it's kind of what the plan is. The plan has always been the idea of having a startup sequence, which if you know your ship, you can prime the engine, turn on the, turn on the batteries um, and do all the, if you know the sequence properly, you can do it much faster than the auto boot up sequence can. So you can get out when you need to. I like that idea still, and I, I still think it's it's good as long as it's an optional because I mean, new players won't have any idea what they're doing. So you don't want to like punish new players with with sim stuff. So uh, yeah, I'm okay with it. Uh, I'm okay with a lot more sim stuff in, into the game as long as they can smooth it out for uh, newer players, so they can make it a little bit easier for them to to get into it. Uh, did I did I butcher your username? It's bo- bugs a qwerty right qwerty bo- bugs qwerty. Bog as Queerty. Bog as Queerty. I guess. I don't know. Sorry, Bog. <laughs> uh, Puppet Master C asks, Drew, was there a moment that you knew you wanted to be a writer? How did you start? Yeah. Uh, oh, yes, there was. Um, actually, I can actually, actually thank Elite for this because when the original game came out in 1984, I was a teenager. I was, uh, I was born in 1970, so I was literally 14 at the time. And Elite was the first game I'd ever played, which actually came with a book in it. So the packaging, the original box you know, on, on my version was all to set. So that shows you how old this is. <laughs> um, and uh, but it came with a, an instruction manual and you know, a ship identification chart and all these other bits and pieces. But one of the things inside the box was, was a story. It was actually a novella that came with a book called The Dark Wheel. And it was a 
it was a fairly you know, by modern standards cliched story about boy meets girl on the spaceship you know horrible loss saves the universe kind of thing it, it, you know it was it was quite predictable but it jumped out to me as a 13 year old so wait, wait, you can actually write stories about space and that's a thing that you can do as a job um it's like wow that's what a work cool idea um and so i started writing at the age of 13 based inspired by this story in this in this space computer game and um obviously it was atrocious really really bad teenage angsty stuff at the time which will never ever see the light of day i have actually got some of it but uh, it'll, <laughs> it'll never go public until i'm dead um but um it did start me writing and i st i've never stopped writing ever since now i haven't always made writing a career because it doesn't pay very well uh, so anybody who wants to be a writer big 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 caveat <laughs> very very unlikely to be rich okay um but um um i've never stopped writing all the way through from that age until even to now and it's only in the last sort of um, 15 years that i've actually managed to turn it into something that actually kind of works but um yeah, so I can I can really thank Space Computer Games for getting me into writing. Uh, that's basically where it started all those years ago for me. Awesome. Um, all right, let's. Uh, next question comes from Steve B. Dancer, who asks, "What do you think of the new Scorpius, and how will it fit in next patch? Will uh, will you own it? I mean, yes, Nick. Go ahead, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> just X Wing. Yes, sold. I'll get it." Even if it's just in game, maybe next patch down the road, I like. I don't think I'm gonna pledge for it, but I will get it as soon as I can get it <laughs> in it's, game. I, I, everyone says it's an X-wing, which it is. But like when I take one look at it, I'm like, this is a, this is a, it's bigger. Uh, it's bigger. It, it feels much more like a, um, oh, what is it called? A Star Fury from Star Babylon Fury 5. From, uh, yeah, Babylon 5, yeah, yeah, because yeah. yeah. it's got that X frame and everything like that, but. Um, but it's kind of like a Star Fury meets uh, uh, meets X Wing, and that's kind of the sort of stuff. So, but yeah, have you seen it, Drew? The 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 I saw I saw the picture of it. Yeah, it's, it, yeah, it does look very cool in a sort of spaceshipy kind of a way. Which yeah, <laughs> um, yep. Yeah, no, I like the design. Um, Thunderbolts maybe more like uh, more than Star Fury. Yeah, yeah. From the 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 the, the upgraded version of the Star Fury. Thank you, Omega. <laughs> Um, all right. Next question comes from, uh, Canadian TV who asks when Xenothreat does become a dynamic event, how frequent do you get, uh, do you guys think would be, f uh, fair that it shows up and what would you like to, um, like to trigger the event? Mm. I, I've, I've thought about this. So let me give, give me a few moments and I'll, and I'll, I'll, I'll spell it out. So the whole thing is Xenothreat invading Stanton. So, in my mind, you'd need both legal and illegal missions to happen for this to happen, or, or uh, you know, Xenothreat and Stanton side side missions, with Xenothreat having some sort of big uh, bring us supplies. We'll go buy supplies. So you know, if we need, if you need supplies for. Uh, you know, medical supplies, ammo, uh, armor, uh, spare equipment, that kind of stuff. So that's kind of like a, a meter where like they you have to give them a certain number before they can reach that point. Once they've reached that point, they can start off on it. But also with missions from Xenothreat to say, go scout out this region, go into to Stanton, go clear out this area, go attack this convoy, see what see what the, 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 the whole things are and come back and tell us how many uh, fighters they are using for these convoys. And, uh, you know, obviously something on, on the, the more lawful side, the more Stanton side, where you, you're investigating these attacks on various uh, trade routes and trying to stop these, these Xenothreat folks from coming in. Uh, so I mean, I just had a massive, like, epiphany when you were talking mm -hmm. about that, where it was like, you can tie in all the dynamic events mm -hmm. together for that. Like you can have the pyro side where they got to prep. They have three Idrises. They got to prep for it. They're mm -hmm. unlawful. They don't have a lot of fun. So they got to come into pyro and maybe attack convoys and stations and lock them down. Like the nine tails lockdown to get those supplies to bring back to the Idris, which then turns into an attack on pyro, which then they're refueling the javelin and get that ready. Cause now they, the, they're the attack they, that they weren't ready for is happening. And, 
it's it, you can literally tie in all the events together and have them progress to one big battle and like over time and have it be repeatable dynamically i mean that's just i th- i feel like they can really go crazy with like tying which dynamic event triggers the next dynamic event which triggers the next one and the next one and as if, if they can make that be very clear on where you are in the progress of these events and w- roughly how long it will be till the next one or like you know what you got to achieve to get to the next one maybe just loosely through like you know conversations here and there i think that'd be like mm. yeah so good any thoughts it'd be good to feel that yeah, I, I, I'm just, I'm, you know, I'm constantly um, thinking of it from a perspective of kind of writing that sort of stuff. Is that um, if you're going to have, you know, shifting political allegiances and, and trigger events, you you do need to sort of, um, uh, you know, uh, yeah, yeah. Say as Nick has just said, you know, have sort of signposting stuff that's kind of giving you a flavour. And this this place is going downhill really badly. Um, and so maybe if you rock up at the space station, there, there's there's missions to, you know move things in a certain direction maybe a positive direction and there's there's missions for for the ne'er do well you know role players who want to move things in a, in a negative direction and as the balance of power shifts maybe fewer and fewer missions become available for you know for one side rather than the other which kind of reflects the status of of, of the kind of political environment in that locale um the, the one thing i really want to avoid in those sort of things is those you know, temperature bars that basically yeah. saying, oh, you've, you've managed to get that far. And you managed, I hate those. I hate yeah. temperature bars in, in these kind of games. That's you, You've got to be smarter and more intelligent than that. Um, any kind of progression bar to me is an absolute no-no because it's just a complete narrative killer. Um, whereas if you've got the sense of, you know, there's, there's, you know, there's hardly any good guys left in this station to run missions to anymore because, you know, it looks like we're just losing this place and, you know, the other guys are taking over. That tells you, you know, we're losing this, we're losing this one. We've got to, we've got to reinforce somewhere else, but you've got yeah. to be thinking a little bit more about what you're, what you're picking up from the environment, which I, which I think would be really, really cool if you can pull it off. Yeah, I could see something like that as well, where it's like, because if the Xeno threat, the leader of Xeno threat is very egotistical, he's very much the kind of guy who's going to, the the the, the dictator who's sitting up there being like, we will defeat them, and the, the, the whole kind of, like, he wants, loves to see himself projected on screens, he gives that vibe, so I can see that, like, maybe you start seeing him giving these speeches that are like, like, we will defeat the, our enemies. We're, we're like, like more frequently. And you're starting to seeing his violence. We're, the time is nigh for us to, to, to strike back at the heart of the beast, you know, all that sort of things. That would also be nice. A little, little flavor. You can be like, Oh, something really is going to happen. Isn't it? He's not just talking about generic stuff anymore. He's talking about tomorrow. Like we're going to do this. And uh, that would, that would kind of give Q players in that something big's about to happen. So you best be yeah. ready. So. And, and if you're if you're if you're very clever with your narrative, what you can do is you can play events whereby you know you, you may have a, not just two opposing sides, but maybe there's a, a triumvirate going on, like a, a triangle of possibilities, where one side is looking at okay, well if we can engineer that those two fight each other for a while, um, then actually what they're going to do is they're going to weaken themselves, and then we can sneak in and take over the thing once they've kind of you know, they're kind of worn yeah. down. So. You, know, you might end up going, actually, I've just weakened these other guys and then this other bunch have just snipped in and, and, and that's not what I wanted to happen either. Uh, so if you could engineer possibilities like that, that'd be very, very clever gameplay. Yeah, right. I can see it. It'll have, like, it's a Xeno Threats attacking Stanton. Who's defending Pyro? If they have three Idrises in the Stanton system on attack, I mean, by Mike L1, what's to say another Syndicate like Tycho's isn't trying to sneak in a pyro and attack Z- Xeno threat directly. Like, or, or even the other gangs of pyro being like, Hey, they're gone. We can take back the station, you know? Uh, yeah, exactly. You know? <laughs> yeah. It's, that, that's been my big theory is that what CIG may do in the future is uh, whenever Xeno threat attacks Stanton, they causes a gang war to erupt in pyro. Where everyone's like, they're weak. Let's go. Let's, let's pounce while they're weak and take on the station. So, um, so I don't know. And also, you know, potentially for for small time operators in Stanton, you know, the fact that you know the the major security forces have have to be mobilised to deal with the um, you know the Zeno threat means that there's maybe a little bit more opportunity for smuggling around, you know, because yeah. there's less security available, which which might be good news for you know, your kind of playing. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, uh, you, which you, is yeah, you know, oh, there's less police around. Great, excellent. Yes, <laughs> and I don't have to get scanned as much, you know. 
or uh, or say there's like a weird system in with pyro where like say there is a gang war what if you could pick a gang side and fight for that gang and then the the the, deter, the determinant winner is that gang controls the area until the next attack yeah right and then it just it, it can swap power based on what the players do on the next attack and yeah. And this this all sounds crazy, but it's it's very much possible with the current status of like what CIG's tools are, and, and also just what how games are made. It's a lot of this is just if then statements in, in embedded in code. Yep. So, um, uh, but I, I agree with you the whole like I hate heat bars, I hate progress trackers because because yeah. like those kind of those progress like 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 uh, bars that you can do, it just defeats the purpose of like like oh well this station's about to flip, why yeah. like that doesn't that make any sense. It too. It just yeah. turns into a board game then, and it's not it's not a narrative thing. Um, yeah, that, that drives me absolutely crazy is one of the things I really didn't like about some of the directions they took Elite in is 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 everything became a temperature bar and a achievement unlocked. And yeah. that is very much not the point of well, at least in my head, not the point of the game. Yeah. Um because, you know, the original games didn't you know, you had ranks, you know, you you one of the big things about the original thing was you start off with harmless and eventually you became elite but you didn't know how close you were to the next rank at any stage and in the early games it was literally just the number of ships you shot down that was all the 8-bit computers could really cope with but um you know you when you achieved your next rank it was like oh wow yeah i'm I'm now a xyz you didn't know it was coming because unless you religiously kept tally charts of what you were doing you couldn't figure it out so that sort of yeah now i'm now I've just achieved that accolade uh, meant a lot more because you didn't just have a temperature bar that was slowly filling up. And the problem with temperature bars uh, and percentages and things like that is they encourage this thing that is now called grinding, I think, mm. because you can see, oh, OK, so if I do six missions, that moves me up six percent. Therefore, if I do 36 missions, it will move me up 36 percent, which means I can do that in the next couple of hours, which is I can achieve the next rank. And it, it encourages the wrong type of gameplay. Um, I think so. If you've got a much more sophisticated rep system, which allows you to build rep or lose rep, but not necessarily that you know um, behind the scenes, I think that's much, much, much stronger from a narrative perspective. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Uh, that's so that's probably one of my bigger gripes with the current rep system is that you actually can see your progress. It'd be better if you just yep. saw your rank rather than your progress. So, or you um, could hollow the person and be like, and just like know through a conversation, kind of roughly where your yeah, setting is, based yeah. on how, how they pick up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you again? And what do you want this time? As yeah. opposed to, yay! Oh, well, we've like, been oh, looking you, forward to you coming back because you. we know you can solve this for us because you're so reliable. You know, or ah, uh, okay, so you're back, are you? You know, yeah. my- <laughs> that is how you should tell your reputation, not a temperature bar. You know, my my favorite contractor to oh, my, what do you want? <laughs> you know <laughs> or straight to like it's like don't call me again hang up oh, that would be like, great you have a bad rep yeah that's right yeah you failed that mission well i ain't talking to you again I, uh, I, you can I, find another way i'd love to hold the whole you call them they pick it up and they go oh and they just immediately hang up on you like like that would be both funny and interesting like as a way oh i screwed up you know yeah that's right um, yeah. all right or maybe, um go ahead i was gonna say or maybe they can even do a little time thing where like maybe you messed up but like there's still a chance to recover so they could even do a thing where it's just like just like i don't want to talk to you right now call me in like 20 minutes and they then in lore there's that time gate there just like but just in lore to explain a a, a time gate mechanic of like i'm pissed off with you right now don't call me back for at least like another 20 minutes yeah, and yeah, in in the in the Wing Commander series, there's a little bit of history like that because you could fail a mission, and uh, yeah, yeah, we, I, I've literally been doing because I failed a mission today on the <laughs> things I was doing, and it was um it, it was basically um yeah well maybe your reputation wasn't as good as we thought, Mister Blair, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> it's just like oh god, I feel really bad now, um and yeah, and then the reaction of you know it, it's a fairly linear storyline as you know but yeah there are a few divergent paths there as a result now that was what we could do back in the 90s you know it's 2022 now so you know with 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 modern computer program dicks you know to do those kind of um you know narrative reinforcements of actually you screwed up uh <laughs> here's your hint i think it would yeah. be really 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 cool yeah yeah uh all right um we've got four more questions uh one is from hydrolux who asks what are your expectations for Xenothreat this patch? Will it be good or bad? I hope it wasn't asked by somebody else. Now it wasn't. Um, 
I can start. I think it's going to be fine. I, I think it's not going to get as much accolades as it did last year or the last time it was in just because this is the third time we've had Xeno Threat. So it's kind of like, yeah, this is great. It's good. Still got bugs, but it's good. But it, it, it's starting to get that kind of, yeah, we'll, we, we've played this before. Let's let's move on. Let's find something new. I don't know. What do you think, Nick? Uh, I'm kind of in the same boat. I've I've done it every time it's come out, and it's kind of like, it's good. It's stable with the tech you still have. Yep, pretty much more of the same, and I'm ready for the next one, but I'm still going to play the crap out of this one because I want the Alpha UEC. <laughs> uh, Drew, are you going to play it? Because I know you haven't had a chance. I will to give it. it. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, is it is it about to shut down again soon? Because uh, if it is, I'll Sunday. Probably... Sunday is when I'll, it shuts down. I'll see if I can try it tomorrow then in that case. Um, I haven't tried it yet, no, so I don't, yeah. I'm not really in that informed position. <laughs> Uh, all right, Ionic Gecko asks, do you have a backstory for your character in Star Citizen, and how will you roleplay as your character in-game? That's interesting. I do, but I'll let Nick, Nick if, say if Nick has anything like that yet. Uh, I haven't, like, roleplayed a character yet. I did one in Elite Dangerous with the same uh, username, and that was, like, a more of a backstory on my character being, like, um, kind of betrayed by his father um just to two laws and everything even though he was a higher up in say um it was the federation i was in in elite danger so it's sort of like the same thing here with the ubc i kind of probably go with the same backstory of like he was betrayed by his father of the ubc and he's against it now um mm -hmm. and he's um actually like escaped the system and he learned that like you know his wife's death was based on his father's betrayal so instead of actually becoming a bad guy he joined the uee to grow in ranks to get back to him, to get close to him. Okay. So very, that's very, very cool. my backstory. Yep. Do you have anything yet, Drew, in your own experience? I, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. Yeah. So I've, I've always had a character name that I use in space games, which is a, a, a character I name I picked up from a book in the eighties, which I, I, alas, I've forgotten the book, but the name has stuck with me and I've always used it as this kind of initially a save game file. And then later on as a, a persona in all the space games I've played. So I have a character called Alessia Verdi, who's a sort of, um, of a t some sort of generic Italian descent that I kind of use as a, a, a lady character in the game. So I'm using her in Star Citizen at the moment, but I haven't figured out the backstory yet. I'm, I'm kind of going with a um, uh, kind of, um, you know, poor sort of um, general uh, person who's just kind of hanging around one of the planets until one day she gets a memo saying, you know, by the way, your uh, your late father just died. He's left you this stuff. And it turns out she's inherited a ship and she knows nothing about anything. And she's basically jumps on the ship and goes, OK, what do I do? You know, and then yeah. she learns it's a, you know, it's a ship with a bad rep and it's, you know, the, the universe is a tough place and all that kind of stuff. So that's kind of where I'm going in my head at the moment, but I haven't really formalized it yet. Awesome. Yeah, I've I've many people have uh, kind of asked me this before. So the, the, the whole basic idea is uh, my character's from um, uh, Magnus, this is the Magnus system on Berea, which is the uh, the the, the planet where Drake Interplanetary is from. Uh, grew up there. Uh, joined the joined the uh, joined the navy. Got out as soon as he could. Then went to uh, use use the what he could from the navy to uh, become a to go to, to go to school at the University of Magnus. Then eventually. Uh, uh, start just trying to start up his own bar. He wants to create his own his own bar somewhere, um, and in the process, uh, he's, he's trying to yeah. he's he's trying to make money to 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 form his own bar, and so that's he's just kind of ended up smuggling. So that's just him. He's just using because it's it's it, it's he he knows people because he grew up in you know Magnus Berea is kind of a uh, a very shattered uh, former econ like industrial city that was like an industrial planet that had it was like the center of the UEE for uh, UE military's ship production and then one day they were just like buy and went to keep the keel system but they had prevented any economic development of the magnus system because it was so classified so when they left they just left and they just pulled out and like all the systems collapsed like all of the the businesses that were built there collapsed okay. Yeah. So, so it's very kind of like trying to build itself back up in lore. So I was like, yeah, I come from this rough area of the of the galaxy where knowing someone who's a smuggler or a pirate is as common as knowing someone who's a security officer or a teacher. So, you know, using the connections that my character has, it's just, yeah, it's the fastest way of making money and, you know, do what you can sort of thing. So, like, yeah, I can get that for you. 
Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. Next question comes from Jude and Tonic, who asks, hey, Lord of Lore. God, I can't believe I gave myself that title. Uh, <laughs> how many javelins have been built? And how did Xenothreat get three of them? No, they don't have javelins. They have Idris's Jin. And there are... Okay, I don't know how to put this. There are enough Idris's that there are five generations of them. Uh, five different unique builds of them. So, and each one of them has been either sold as surplus or been recycled to build the next generation of Idris's. So... In reality, I would guess anywhere between several hundred and several thousand, because the design itself, the original design is 300 years old. So there could be as many, and there's the original one, the UES Idris, it still exists. It's like kind of being turned into a museum. So it's, it's one of those things where there have been different designs. Think of it as kind of like the B-52 or the A-10, where like over time they've kind of swapped out this and that. They've added new systems in, but it kept this, the same frame over time. So any, anywhere, again, anywhere between, uh, yeah, a couple hundred and a couple thousand. It's really hard to tell because, especially during the Mezer era, they weren't exactly as good at record keeping. So some may have just ended up in places they weren't supposed to because someone gave the right money to the right people and no one asked any questions. So, uh, so it's hard to tell, but, um, uh, but yes, there's that's there's a reason why Xenothreat can get a hold of them. We don't know quite yet, but it's they're not uncommon, um, especially if they're older versions. Uh, all right, last question comes from um, I'm gonna say this again. Bog is Quirty. Boga Squirty. Boga Squirty. I can say that. Boga Squirty. There we go. I'll say that. All right. Uh, <laughs> uh, do you feel like you are actually grinding in Star Citizen? Nick, what do you think? Do you feel like you're actually uh, grinding? Uh, a few times I feel like I'm grinding, you know, especially when it's just like I want to save it for money and there's only a limited amount of missions you can do. Um, I will say when I'm doing events like uh, Jump Town and Xeno Threat where money is paid well and you're having fun, it doesn't feel like a grind at all. But say those events aren't going on and I want to like buy a ship and the only thing that's fun to do is bounty hunting and then you do like a 200 bounty hunts to like to do it it's just like yeah it does get pretty grindy but that's just to do the systems that are in right now that just don't allow that just like exploration of other venues and revenues where it's just like yeah i can have fun mining but i'm just sitting looking at meters or i can do cargo but i'm just sitting and looking at meters <laughs> so it's you know i'd rather do the most engaging thing and right now that's combat and fps combat but um it's kind of like two things right now that's kind of like engaging exhilarating um and i i kind of really don't get to that gr whole kind of trades uh occupations to find be engaging for me so i feel like the experience is pretty limited and just kind of forces it to be grindy for what we have right now drew your experience so far is it very grindy for you or do you feel like you're grinding not not at all actually um that's one thing that has surprised me because you know you're kind of quite used to a sort of grind mechanic in in, in modern games and um the, the the thing that i've been delighted to find is everything i wanted to do i can do with the cutlass black um so if i want to go and you know land on the surface and walk down into a cave i can do that if i want to dock with the space station i can do that if i want to um, carry some stuff between here and there i can do that um so i haven't felt any particular drive to get a um you know a, a bigger and better ship at, the, at this point in the game even even the combat stuff that i've engaged with uh particularly when I, I managed to drag my younger son along with me and put him in the turret of the cutlass black and i was flying the ship um we were very effective in that combination as a as a you know against the, the things that we were fighting against um so i haven't looked at it and gone you know i need to get the xyz ship because that's got the thing um and as a result everything i've i've done is just has just been fun and exploration as far as I've been concerned. Um, there are some ships there that I think, actually, yeah, I wouldn't mind having one of those at some point, especially now the Soul Citizens have sort of shown me around. Um, but I don't feel, you know, part none of, none of the game seems to be gated behind a thing that I go, oh, I've got to go in out and do a whole bunch of other stuff in order to get to that bit of the gameplay that I want to do, mm -hmm. uh, which has been absolutely really refreshing that it's not gated. Uh, I haven't come across anything 
thus far that I feel is gated behind a you've now got to go away for a couple of hours and do a thing that you don't probably want to do in order to get back to that gated activity. That has been a real, oh, thank God for that. Because <laughs> so many games uh, are locked behind gated progress bars, which are, are quite often just really, um, really artificial, particularly in regards to things like, um, you know, lore and stuff. I mean, Elite had got very bad with that in terms of Odyssey, where... Um, now, you couldn't take on certain missions without having unlocked an engineer to do this to your spacesuit, which you already had on the spaceship, but you couldn't do it on foot. And it's like, that's just very, very artificial. Um, and um, Star Citizen hasn't done that to me at all. So everything I could just go and try it. And, and quite often it goes wrong because I've got the inexperience, but that's my problem, not the game's problem. If that makes sense. Yeah. I, I don't think Star Citizen's really grindy. I think there are aspects of it which are. But those aspects are more like, I want to make money. How can I make the best money? And I think that will get mitigated by the future additions. Like one of the big things that they have right now, which just really isn't a, a factor, but will be in the future, is things like food and water and, and those sorts of things. But also things like um, time your ship has for for atmosphere like if your ship is not going to have infinite amounts of oxygen in it eventually you're going to have to stop off and refill your your uh, life support systems to make sure that you you're, you can function your suits are now infinite all right now infinite except for like you know oxygen but eventually they'll even have the fuel on the suits will have the, the fuel and power and such which are things they want to do so having those factors in will force players to go to stations and stop and get, you know, grab a hot dog, grab a, grab a soda, you know, uh, go, go, go refill their, their suits, their tanks and get all those sorts of things. I think that'll break up the monotony of a lot of those things. And every so often you'll do that and you'll just pop, pop up in your mobile glass or you'll get a comm from a random mission giver you've worked with in the past and said, I got a job for you. You're in the system. Do this for me. And I think that's really what Star Citizen, you can actually already see that going on Star Citizen. Yeah, yeah. And I think in the future, as more systems come online, it'll become more of that, you know, just happen to be in the Hurston system and someone I worked, did one or two missions with is like, I trust you. I've got this job. Do it for me. And it's like, oh, well, I can I can do that instead of having to go off and do another mission. I'm, I'm still three jumps away from my destination. So why not make a little, little bit of money so I can fill up my tanks sort of thing. So um, I, I like the idea of being able to plan in advance. So, you know, the, the idea of, you know, an oxygen um thing for your suit and a fuel thing for your suit and obviously for your individual self food and drink mm -hmm. that that all seems perfectly reasonable to me as long as it's as long as it's balanced so it's not like every five minutes five you minutes, eat a hot yeah. dog kind of thing you know? yeah <laughs> but uh, um yeah if you could if you could also on your ship you know store a, a bunch of batteries or store a bunch of hot dogs or whatever the, yeah. whatever the equivalent is or uh, some you know some water or you know i'm gonna i'm gonna cut down a quarter of my cargo capacity because i want a whole bunch of extra fuel tanks or oxygen supplies or whatever it happens to be it gives you choices to how you want to run the operation of your ship um that sort of stuff to me it really adds again to the kind of okay well it's going to reward me if i plan ahead here because i don't kind of what i'm going into but if i need to do an extended eva I'm okay with that. Otherwise, I've, I'm I'm running into the whole tents. Am I actually going to run out of, you know, the actual supplies I need to keep doing this before I can conduct the mission? So, yeah, it's going to reward planning uh, and stuff like that. I think that'd be really cool. Yeah, that's 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 effectively what they want to do. Uh, and like, food and drink is in the game right now, but it's just you hardly ever notice it unless you've been out playing the game for six hours. And at that point, you look down, you're like, oh, my food meter is, or my water meter is dropped right. to like 70%. So it's, it's so probably, small. Probably your stomach is rumbling as well in yeah. real life. <laughs> so, um, yep. but it, and, and, you know, if you stay alive for long enough, then yeah, you have to do it. But it's like, go buy a hot dog at a store, at, at this vendor and, and get a bottle of water and you're, you're good, like for another seven hours or something like that. So, but I, I, yeah, that's definitely something that I know CIG wants to do where it's like, you have to start planning your own supplies and logistics as much as it is anything else. So that's, it's, you can go a little bit longer. You can store extra fuel on your ship, but you're going to have to refuel it manually when you get there, you know, like your own tip, pull out the jerry can and dump it in sort of concept, yeah. you know? Uh, and there's so on the combat side, like have to like, you know, maybe have cargo of extra missiles, extra, uh, mm -hmm. like, you know, ballistic ammo bullets, magazines. you know? Yeah. Just, just so you can swap them out and be like, okay, reload me manually, you know, just like, come on. <laughs> yeah. 
So yeah, and I, I think I think that whole thing will break up the monotony in terms of the just the average grind as it were. Yeah, that's it. Doesn't feel like a grind then because you're kind of planning and working on strategies and stuff. And having friends is also nice. Having having other people to play with when you're playing it also makes the grind or makes the makes the gameplay a little bit more engaging, uh, especially when they do dumb stuff uh, like like cross in front of you when you're trying to fire and suddenly you're like I'm gonna drag my <laughs> drag you behind cover and heal you up again because I run in front of my guns. Sure, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things I was really delighted to discover, but uh, um, and I hadn't realized this was in the game at all, is why we my son and I were playing in the Cutlass Black shooting some sort of drone target things i can't remember quite what the mission was but um you know i was maneuvering around and I, he, we were talking to each other on discord and he basically said to me dad can you stop maneuvering and i said well, why he says because i can't get off the floor <laughs> <laughs> he says oh, i'm knocked away like, oh, and i was yeah. like what do you, you can't get off the floor and he says i'm pinned to the floor by the exact i think it's the g-forces in the ship and i suddenly thought that was such a cool gaming moment because we were laughing about it over lunch <laughs> Um, the fact that he'd been incapacitated because he'd got out of the turret, not realizing that that would have an impact on the gameplay, um, and then he couldn't get back in the turret. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 actually a more recent one because people still don't realize it. I still forget it every so often because you know uh, you have to sit down. It's the only way you could handle the G forces, and uh, it's always fun when you when you're in a combat mode where you're like, hey, we got to get out of here now, and no one's not everyone's sitting down. You're just like, just lay down, just hug the ground, and hope you you don't get thrown <laughs> around. Yeah, I, so. I play in a milsim org, and we found that uh, if you go at ease, which is very milsim like when you're just sitting and waiting, is uh, it actually negates the G forces. So everyone will be like, go at ease, so you're not knocked down, and then you see like another marine. I can't go into thing, and then just get knocked right over and you see like super, people being super serious and then you just see the one guy just falling on the ground really like, it's just it just causes so many funny moments like that all right that was the last cool. that's the last question thank you so much to drew and to nick for coming in and talking with us today at uh about uh but Star Citizen, taking your questions and everything, make sure that you are following them both on Twitch and, and YouTubes and buy Drew's books, as, as I said last time, buy them. Thank um, you very much. Look up, yeah. look up Drew, Drew, Drew Wager, uh, Drew Yeager, Wager? You got it right. That was it. That's right. Yep. You're good. <laughs> Drew Wager. Um, and uh, if you watch this and you were like, hey, I want to see Star you know, Captain's Table live, well, you can come join us at twitch.tv slash theastropub. Every Saturday, or mostly every Saturday, 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern, 11 p.m. UTC. And uh, you can come watch live. You can actually ask these questions live as well. Uh, and, yeah, thanks again, y'all, for watching. And like I say every time, hope to see you someday in the black. Thank you very much, folks. See you in the verse.